How's it going guys and welcome to Billy the Bat Boys Corner presented by Up On Game. I'm Billy Pinckney and today we have Anthony Claggett joining the show, play for the Pittsburgh Pirates, the New York Yankees, and is currently the pitching coach at Washington State University. We go way back. We worked together in 2015 as he was the pitching coach for the New Jersey Jackals. So we're excited to join up and, and talk about some of the ins and outs of college pitching and recruiting process and what he looks for in players and also touch on his playing career as well. All right, guys, we're here alongside former big leaguer and current pitching coach at Washington State University, Anthony Clagg. Anthony, appreciate you hopping on. Thanks, Billy. Appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Well, I'd love to bring it back to the beginning of your pro career, drafted by the Tigers in 2005, but then traded to the Yankees in a big deal for Gary Sheffield. I mean, that's pretty special right there to be traded for a big-name guy like that. Do you remember that day pretty well? I do. I do. Um, I was one of three in the trade. Um, I was, quote-unquote, the third guy kind of thrown in. Um, but it was special. It really was. I, I remember I was actually... I think it was like a Saturday um, and I was taking a nap. It was about noon or so. And um, I woke up and the bottom line, you know, you see the scroll on ESPN, the bottom line there and it said the Yankees made a trade with the Detroit Tigers and Humberto Sanchez, uh, Kevin Whalen, and then Anthony Claggett or Gary Sheffield kind of looked at it as eh, that's, that's my name. That, I just got traded. And then the next thing you know, my phone starts blowing up and um it was great though. Uh, Dave Dombrowski called and from the Tigers, the GM, and said thanks for everything. And I was like, well, that thanks for giving me an opportunity is basically my response. And then Brian Cashman called a couple minutes later and introduced himself and said, Welcome to Yankees. So um it was a special moment. Didn't know how big of a deal it was at the time, but um it was a it was a really cool moment for for me and my family. It's pretty interesting how sometimes the news gets out to the public before it does to the players who are involved with the trade, right? It was, yeah. I actually called my my agent too, yeah. uh, and he goes, "Yeah, I thought I would get a phone call about that," um, which he did a couple minutes later. But uh, you know, sometimes you get traded and it's not even your choice. Which, in my position, I was just finishing up a ball, so uh, I was just happy to be in pro ball and. Um, really excited to actually get to Yankee Zoe and everything that or, that organization is. Um, I was stoked. I was really excited for to be to wear the pinstripes and be a Yankee. Right. We then ascended throughout the Yankees minor league system. How would you describe the developmental stages that the Yankees had in place then? Professional would probably be the best word I can use. Um, use that in the, the highest remark as well. I, they just did things that um, were efficient. They had meaning behind it. Um, I think from every coach that you dealt with, pitching coach or or other, um, to things about how you dress properly. And obviously everyone knows about the facial hair and stuff like that. There was just a different aura about it. Um, when you stepped in the locker room or even – you know, outside of baseball, you know, how you carry yourself, you're a Yankee, um, you're part of the organization, you're part of the system. So um, to do things professionally in every aspect of your life is really what they taught you. And then it just carried over on the field. I mean, they, you know, you still have tremendous amount of fun. I mean, you're smiling, you're running around, you're bouncing around. It's, it's enjoyable, um, but you do things right. And I think, uh, I think they had, every aspect taken care of, of of what that meaning was to to be a professional and obviously they still do so um you know be, being with that organization and where they were at at that time as well they were doing really well so um everyone looked up to them and kind of followed suit um but from a insider perspective being a player there it was an eye-opening experience that just every aspect was to be a pro and actually it was really enjoyable to be part of well, you eventually got the call to the big leagues. Can you describe that day and this, the emotions that went behind that? Yep. Um, so the night before, we're at home in Scranton, um, just got finished with the game. And it was actually about, I, I want to say it was the fifth or sixth day I haven't pitched. So I was kind of questioning what's going on here. And so got done, uh, showered up, get ready to leave. And the pitching coach says, hey, why don't you hang back for a little bit? So, um, 
kind of when you hear that, there's a couple things go through your mind, right? Did I get traded again? Um, did I get a call up? I think I'm pitching pretty well. Uh, something, right? So hung back a little bit. Um, then I got called in the office with the skipper and pitching coach, and uh, they told me the news. So um, packed up my stuff. I told a couple locker mates, a couple buddies of mine that were still hanging around, and congratulations and all that. And then got home, packed up, because uh, I had to drive to New York the next day, and they had a day game. So had to leave early in the morning and obviously called my family and my friends, told them all the news. Um, so I woke up early and then just hopped down the trail to, to the Bronx. Um, I think the coolest moment that I really, when it really kind of hit me was when I was driving from, from Jersey um, to the George Washington bridge. And when you kind of just get over that hill you can just see the skyline. You could see all of New York and Manhattan and all that stuff. And I was like, that, I'm driving there to go play a ball game. Um, so was, that was pretty special. And then you get in, um, and I'll tell you a quick story, which is pretty neat. But you know, I'm a rookie and I'm driving, so I got in my truck, and it's the first year of the new stadium, you know, and uh, it sits on a, basically a block. So I'm driving. I'm trying to find the players' um, parking lot and. and parking structure. So I'm driving, I, I circle around probably about one and a half times and I, I know I missed it. So, so then I roll down my window and I see a security guard and I ask him, Hey, where does players parking? I go, okay, I'll, I'll help you. So he's running along the sidewalk and I'm just driving next to him and he points me in the right direction. And uh, I get to the parking garage and it goes down underneath the stadium. Um, and I just run a security guard goes, Hey, Rook, make sure you park at the end. You know, don't take uh don't take Mo or Jeter or a rod spot. You're a rookie park at the end. So, um, but that was pretty special. And um, yeah, that's, I got the news and headed down to the Bronx day game and, and get ready to roll. That's awesome. When you step into that clubhouse for the first time, you see all the, all the lockers and everybody, do you remember any of those initial conversations? Yeah, it was, yeah, it was, um, it was pretty cool. Cause you know, I got to spend, um, pretty much every day, except I, I got sent down pretty much the last day in spring training. So I got to, you know, in big league camp. So I had a really good camp. So I got to know those guys a little bit, um, you know, quite a bit and talk with them. And then some guys my age, like uh, Java Chamberlain and Ian Kennedy, um, Phil Hughes, you know, those guys were all kind of the same age kind of going up. So when I got the call up, um, I remember I, I walked into the locker room, um, got my locker was next to Melky Cabrera. And then, um, I got to see Phil Hughes, you know, he came and said, what's up real quick and said, hi. And, um, next guy kind of come up was Derek Jeter and he was, you know, it's just his, his nature. That's what he does. And came and Phil, you know, shook my hand and said, welcome and all that stuff. And short, short words of wisdom. Um, and then, yeah, you know, everyone just kind of just came up and said, congratulations. And it was quick, you know, it, it was brief, um, but it was just like, Hey, let's, let's go to work type of thing. But uh, they also wanted to make me feel welcome and, and knew it was a special moment that they they've had before too. So uh, I was really fortunate, just great guys to be around and really, really fortunate to be in the locker room with them. You're on the same pitching staff too as Mariano Rivera. Were you able to take anything away from him? Yes, I was. I, I, we can probably get my debut later of what the box score looked like, which wasn't the best. But um, so after I came out of the game and I came in relief for Chimmy Wong and came in um, into the locker room after my outing and, you know, the game's still going on, but I'm sitting down there in the locker room for a little bit, just trying to grasp my breath. So I'm sitting next to Chimmy Wong over here on the couch. And then it was about the sixth inning or so Mariana Vera came in. And the, the score was really out of hand. So Mo wasn't completely getting ready to go, you know, get a save. Um, but uh, yeah, he sat down and talked to me and he talked a lot about, you know, he's basically said, you're probably going to get sent down after, you know, after the game tonight and go back to work in triple a, you know, make sure you get things taken care of and you'll be back. Um, but just a tremendous amount of um, words of wisdom that. Kind of put me in a mindset of ease, you know. It's just 
not like, oh no, this is my last, this is my last chance, or I'm never going to get back here. I mean, it was just to go back to work, man. I mean, that's, you got here for a reason. Um, you, you deserve to get this opportunity. Um, just go back to work and you'll get another one. So, you know, anytime you hear something like that from obviously one of the best to ever do it, um, you listen and that's as a coach's son growing up, you, you turn on your ears and you listen. And uh, when you get some words like that from Mario Rivera, you do listen and, and then you try to apply it when you get back to AAA. And that's what I thankfully did to get another opportunity. But uh, really, really thankful that I got a chance to talk with him you know, briefly. But uh, it was a big moment in my life. Yeah, it's just the veteran leadership in the clubhouse. It's definitely an underrated factor in a successful team. I mean, they went on to obviously win the World Series that year. But I mean, you need those veteran leaders and that presence on a ball club. Yeah. What a great mixture that team was. Um, like you said, you got Mo, you got Posada, you had Pettit, you had Jeter, um, and then you had some some younger guys. You, you got CC Sabathia, AJ Burnett, Phil Hughes, Jabba, uh, Ian Kennedy, you know Melky, you know. So it was a great mixture of of some vet, you know, veterans and um, guys who have done it for a long time, but great great mentors, great clubhouse guys. And then you got some young guys that the Swisher, you know, just keeping it light too. Um, so I think there was a good balance. And I, I know there's been plenty of books read about that, but um, I, in seeing that, and again, I'm, I'm just this rookie kind of glancing around, but um, you could really tell that the vibe was really, really special. Um, and because of that balance. Right. I had Jabba Chamberlain on the last episode, too, and he talked about the chemistry and, and how good it was for having different personalities and adding a bunch of free agents in the offseason. And you never know what's going to happen with that if they're going to mix in well. And it seemed like, obviously, it, it worked out. World Series champs. And you ended up getting a ring, right? I did. Yep. Um, I was up and down three different times that year. Pitched twice. But, um, yeah, ended up getting a ring. And that's that's still special to my heart. You know, I, to be honest, uh, it took a long time for me to feel like I deserved it in some form or fashion. Uh, you know, you pitch twice, both outings weren't the best. Um, and actually I was traded over to the pirates even before the playoffs happened, but, um, you look back on it and you kind of like, you know, I put in a lot of work to get that opportunity. And, um, in some way, maybe I helped, but, uh, I'm really proud of it. My, Family's proud of it. Um, I'm very thankful to the Yankees that they did give me one, um, you know, because there, there's no reason to, to be honest. They gave it to a lot of guys that were up that year, um, which is just another first class deal that the Yankees do. So uh, some I'll treasure forever and um, some of my kids will get to see one day and, and wear it. So, uh, yeah, I'm really fortunate to have that. You just mentioned you went over to the Pirates after the Yankees. What were some of the noticeable differences that you recognized when it comes to playing in Pittsburgh versus New York? Yeah, there there was a quite a bit, and especially at that time, um, the Yankees were at the top of their game, um, and the Pirates weren't. You know, just from that standpoint, had a, a few hundred lose hundred lost seasons um, in the past few years, so. You know, there was some struggle there. There's some turnover. Um, I would say for me personally at the time, I was like, it's another opportunity to play in the big leagues, um, you know, because I got got traded over. And then right away I went down to Bradenton in Florida. Uh, I threw in one uh, extended spring training or extended uh, uh, thing down there through one outing. And then they said, hey, you want to finish the rest of the season in the big leagues? Well, absolutely. Let's do it. So I called up and they were in Chicago at the time and finished out the year. But, um, you you know, at, at the time, you're trying to just go and do your job and, and figure out how to stay in the big leagues. Um, I, so and it was only a couple of weeks I was there. But, you know, you could kind of see like this is the end of a, a really tough season for these guys. And even though I was just there at the back end, you know, some of those guys that like Zach Duke and Paul Mahalam that uh, that been there and pirate, 
you know, been pirates since their, their beginning, you could see it was a, a little bit of a wear and tear on them. So it wasn't until probably the next year of when I got to spring training, I've just seen the big differences in development, um, how things are ran, stuff like that, that were just different than the pirate or di- different than the Yankees. When you're playing for a team that's maybe less competitive and maybe just not in the playoff race, do you feel like you're playing more for yourself and just for your own statistics rather than trying to help the team win like the Yankees or a contender? You know, I wasn't, I probably wasn't up in the big leagues long enough to get that feeling. Um, you know, from that standpoint, I guess if, if I could go back, which I had a lot more time in triple a um, and I've been on some really good teams uh, and then some really bad teams. So I don't, I don't want to, I mean, every opportunity you get to go out there, whether it's, you know, for a winning team or not, you should treasure it. Uh, I believe I did. I was, again, I was a coach's son who grew up to try to do things right in this game and, and play the game the right way. So, you know, you, you're always trying to perform at your best and, and win a, win a ball game. It's what you're supposed to do. It's your job. So I think from that standpoint, the competitive nature of, of trying to win was always there when you're competing. I would say maybe there are times outside of that, you know, w- where you maybe became a little bit more, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to use, I'm going to get in the weight room more, or I'm going to do this and this, that became a little bit more selfish, or I'm going to, I'm going to be a little bit more um, video oriented and get my stuff dialed in so that I can perform and, get back to the big leagues or get traded and go to another, another organization. So again, I, I don't, I think every guy would tell you that they're, they're going out there to win every single time. I mean, that's just what you do. Um, but I think there are times when it's like, well, I'm with an organization. You got to figure out if it's best for you individually to succeed in that organization. Um, which hopefully you're in the right one. Um, but as long as you're wearing the jersey, you should be happy as a player anyways. Absolutely. I'd like to transition now into your coaching career when you decided that you'd like to get into coaching. I mean, you started off in college coaching a little bit, but then with the New Jersey Jackals in 2015, that's where I met you as a player coach and then truly transitioning into that role following that. When did you realize that being a pitching coach was something that you really want to pursue after your playing days? Well, I, I knew I wanted to do it be, while I was playing, to be honest. Um, I, I knew I was kind of getting to the back end of my career when uh, I played for the St. Saint Paul Saints for a little bit. Um, still trying to get back to the organizational ball, get back to the big leagues or an opportunity maybe in Korea or Japan, stuff like that. Um, but then you get old, right? So <laughs> the body starts to turn on you a little bit. But I've always knew I wanted a coach. Um you know, my, again, my dad was a coach, so that's just always been in my bloodstream, but I would say it was probably, um, I probably played for another four years while I knew like when I'm done here, whenever they take the Jersey from me, you know, off my back as a player, I'm going to coach. And so I'm going to try to gain as much knowledge right now in the thinking of I'm a coach right now. I'm still able to throw, stay a little bit to compete and pitch and, and get out, but my mindset's shifting a little bit into, you know, communication skills or the understanding of ins and outs on a daily basis of how, you know, you go about it from a coach standpoint and all the things you, you start to learn. But um, yeah, I would say I was still playing when I really decided that I wanted to be a coach. And so the transition became really easy. Um, I would say Billy, the, the, the hardest thing, which, I still still tinker around with is the organizational part. I mean, you know, playing all those years and playing 11 years, um, you learn enough about the game. You learn enough about the the pitch part, you know, the the dialect and the communication you have with the player. That's going to be constant. It's always going to be ongoing and learning how to do that and getting the point across. But um, that that just should be natural. That, That feels natural to me. So um, I'm really fortunate. That's why I think, you know, my coaching, even though I've been coaching for, what, six years now, um, advanced pretty fast. But that's because of the playing days 
that transition into just coaching and verbalizing it. So um, the organizational part still getting there, still getting, make sure these players are dialed and organized and all that. But uh, yeah, I, I, I knew I wanted to coach a long time ago and um, I couldn't be happier right now. Well, you're working with players who have all different personalities and backgrounds. Do you have an individualistic approach to working with each player and seeing what's best for them in their career? Do yes, absolutely. Yeah, you ha- I think you have to. You know, you you have your you have your philosophies. Um, you have your your structured of what you want to do um, from a pitching staff standpoint. But when you get down to it individually, that's that's when you're going to pull the most out of a player. You know, that's when you're going to help him reach his full potential. You know, unlock the the box that he never knew he had. Um, relationships number one. It has to be. Um, you got to know your players' ins and outs. You got to know how to talk to them. You got to know how to challenge them. You got to know how to beat them down sometimes. You know, and, and that's something you learn every day. That's something I learn every year with a new staff pitching staff, new guys coming in, or even for that matter, just returning guys that have grown over the course of a summer or something like that. Um, So there's a lot of elements to it and how to train them or get their mind right so they can be effective physically. But, um, you know, I think that's the teaching part. That's, that's when you become a teacher and say coaches wear all different types of hats. Yeah. we got a bunch of them. Um, not old enough yet to be a father figure to some of these guys, but uh, you know I'm still young enough to be a brother figure. And some guys sometimes they need that. We we have a we have a um, policy here with the coaching staff is our door is always open. You know, so guys coming in and any issues that they have, they they know they can come to us. But yeah, it's it's individualized. So you're there for them off the field, and it becomes individualized on the field as far as what they can and can't do from a, an ability standpoint. But um, there's nothing better than when you finding kind of click with a kid and kind of, you know, see his eyes light up when he just, when he just threw like this slice, change your grip a little bit, mess around with this and let's throw this slider here and he rips one off and he's like, where did that come from? You know, those are special moments. So those are things you don't get to if you don't dive into it individually. You were originally a position player, right? I was. I was a uh, a pretty decent defensive shortstop. Okay. Um, I, I played shortstop my whole high school career. Came into UC Riverside as a as an infielder. Um, was pretty good defensively. Had a pretty good arm, and uh, you know a little light with the bat. When I say light, I was I was really light with the bat. So uh, it was it wasn't until my end of my sophomore year until. Um, coach Andrew check. is the, it was the pitching coach there. He's the head coach at UC Santa Barbara, one of the most talented head coaches in college baseball now, but he's the one that kind of got me on the mound and said, Hey, Claggett, you know, um, if you want to continue in this game, it, it might be best to try to get on the mound because the batting ain't, ain't quite working. So, um, he gave me that opportunity and lucky enough, I have a pretty strong arm and uh, so it was my junior year of when I started to pitch. I was still playing infield, but um, I also was our closer and pitched well enough to get drafted that year in the eleventh round. And and I decided to sign and and go start my career. But uh, it was a it wasn't as hard to let the bat down, which most guys would say would be it's hard to yeah, hard to let the bat down. It was actually more hard to let the infield glove down because that was my favorite part. I'm, my favorite part of the day was infield to outfield, you know, show it off a little bit, but uh, the bat was fine. So I, I moved on from that. <laughs> so do you ever scout out like these uh, players who might not be the greatest position players, but through your experiences, do you ever see these guys and say, Hey, you know, I might want to see him on the mound now. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's, um, and I tell recruits that sometimes, you know, they're transferring, transitioning over, um, and I'll tell them my background. And yeah. so that actually, to be honest, and we've had a couple guys who have came in to try to do both do two way. Um, but for the most part, it's going to pan out one or the other, right? It just does. If you want a chance at pro ball, cause you got to put the time into it. But, um, 
Yeah, I, I just tell them that, hey, man, I went through the same experience and I'm going to actually coach you the same way I was coached. I had a really good pitching coach in college. He, he was really diligent about how he transitioned me into a pitcher. You know, he just didn't go full go at it. And here's all the stuff and here's how you be a pitcher. It was a, it was a smooth, slow transition. So um, I, I take that into account to the full when I'm when I'm uh, coaching a guy like that. And then when I'm seeing it with my eyes, you know, like I'm watching a shortstop or something like that, and he's throwing across the diamond, I'm like, that's a pretty good arm. Um, you know, and then there's, you know, we've we've recruited a couple guys to where it's like, okay, if it doesn't work out there, you probably have pitching in your future. Um, you know, so same for me. But, um, yeah, it's just always in the back of my mind because I went through it, and uh, it gives another element to recruiting as well. And it gives another option to a player that, you know, could potentially um, still have a career, just maybe in a different position. So I'm all for it. How do you think the recruitment process has changed since you originally came up? Are there many differences nowadays? Yeah. Yeah. You got a lot of different elements nowadays. Um, You know, a lot with the metrics and analytics stuff out there, you dive into some of that stuff because that can kind of deem the projectability of a guy, Um, you know, everyone kind of utilizes that. Everyone has their own philosophies, you know, each program, um, each pitching coach, each hitting coach, you know, what, what can you, this is what we look at. And I'm sure everybody does, but it's basically like, you know, if there's something that I struggle at coaching that maybe takes a little longer, I'm probably going to go get the guy that can do that pretty well already. You know, so when he comes in, he already has that feature and now I can teach him the other stuff. Most coaches already have something solidified that they feel like they can coach really well. So if that guy that you're recruiting is like a little light on that side, don't worry about that. Okay, I can teach him that. He has these features that I can teach him to do that. It'll be fine. So um, but it has changed. I mean, from when I play, I. You know, it's actually funny because there's still scouts around that still remember when I was at UC Riverside. Oh, Claggett, I remember you. You had a you had a really good arm. Yeah, thanks, man. That's why why I got drafted. Uh, And I remember you couldn't hit. Yeah, that's true. Um, You know, so but I think with all. With all the video access, with all the travel ball stuff, um, you know, it's just everyone is finding no one's no one's like hitting under a rock anymore. Right. There's no guy that you find that's just no one's heard about. Everyone knows about everybody. So um, which is great. But, you know, now it becomes the relationship piece. Now it becomes, you know, you break down the philosophy piece. So there's I think there's a lot more detail than there was back when I played um, because there's more information. And now it's just about sorting it out of, of what you and your program, um, and what what program, uh, the philosophy is of what you want to bring in and, and what type of guys. Is there a specific way that you like to hear about a player? Is it through a showcase, through video sent to you by the player or their high school coach? Or is there is it really not matter? Uh, it doesn't matter, to be honest. You know, I think there's – we have our people that we, we kind of trust as well. So, so when someone reaches out, it's kind of a little bit more of, okay, let's, let's go really dig into this guy. Um, But when someone tells you about a player, you should always follow up, you know, you should always, because they're, they're giving, you know, their input on a guy that is supposed to be deemed that would fit your culture, fit, fit the program that you're at. So, um, yeah, when, when we get help, it's it it's great. I mean, it skips a process of, you know, have to dig through a bunch of stuff and then find a guy. But for the most part, um, we, we just try to trust our relationships with our travel ball coaches or, you know, some advisors or whatever, um, scouts, stuff like that, that, that have seen people because obviously there's so many players. Um, but we'll go look at video. Um we're big on always doing research with talking to the family, um, have to talk to the player multiple times, have to talk to high school coach, travel ball coach, or, or junior college coach, whatever that may be, 
just to get, Hey, is this, is this kid the right fit? Is he the right? You know, I can see he has the ability to be the right fit, but is he the right fit as far as personality? Um, is he a baseball player? You know, things of that sort to where if he can come in, we know what we're going to get. So, um, yeah, there's so much information out there. We just try to utilize as much as we can. And for the younger pitchers out there, maybe in Little League, and, and there's kids working on a, a full arsenal at 12 years old, do you think that there are some kids who should pull back on pitching a little bit when they're younger and ramp it up a little bit more when they're maybe in high school rather than just go full force when they're not even a teenager yet? You know, Billy, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I wish I... I think the number one thing is, is, is if, you know, you make sure that you um, keep the players healthy. You know, I, I, I've seen a lot of pitchers who become PO pitchers only, and they step away from playing another position um, or even playing other sports for that matter. They're just all baseball focused and they're only a pitcher. Um, there's been a lot of guys out there that have done that and it's a little bit too much. You know, that's a little bit too much on their arm. Um, but there's some that have been become extremely polished too. I'm not I'm not gonna say don't do that. Um, but I've you know, I've also seen guys who have played other positions but also pitch, so they gain knowledge of the game a little bit better and um they're a little more athletic. So I've seen that work as well. Um, you know, I we even like guys to play other sports. We don't mind if they play their sports in high school, you know. Being playing basketball is great endurance and conditioning for a baseball player. Um, football toughness, you know, you never want to see anybody get hurt. But so, I mean, I, I think guys who just pitch and have the full arsenal of mixing all their pitches and learning all that at a really young age, I would just say be, you know, some version of cautious, but doesn't mean you, you shouldn't do it. It just, you know, what. Where does it come a time where they get burnt out or when does it come a time where they actually put their harm harm's way? You know, I, the fastball is something we've been throwing for a million years and um, train your arm speed to, to get as much arm speed as possible with the fastball, command the fastball, you know, and then you can develop some other stuff. But um, yeah, I wish I had a better answer for you, Billy. I just, I, the, you know, that stuff probably is a little bit, maybe more uh, individualized and, and, you know, because some kids nowadays are shoot, they're 12 years old and they're six foot two. Yeah. Um, I don't know, you know, are you growing too fast? Um, is that even a thing, <laughs> you know? So um, I would say there's some ins and outs of that, that you probably want to break down. Yeah. Probably just knowing your own body, knowing what you could handle, making sure coaches don't abuse your arm at a young age and just, just seeing what mix works best for you. So I think kid, yeah, smart players have to do that in order to not get injured at a young age and, and realize that. Because there's some coaches out there, they don't care. They just want to win their, their uh, high school championship or their Little League travel tournament. And just for their own personal record, not really with much concern for the player. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. Um, and there are some, you know, there are. But maybe that's when a parent, as a parent, you would step in, um, you know, or or friend of that person. But yeah, this, let's take care of these kids. Let's make sure they not only are physically um, staying healthy, but also mentally. Let's not burn them out. You know, let's make sure they still enjoy this great game and, you know, and can take it to as long as they can um, and give them that opportunity. Anthony, I appreciate you hopping on. Always great talking to you and best of luck this year. Hey, Billy, appreciate it, man. Good seeing you. Thanks for your time. I'll talk to you soon. Well, we appreciate you joining us here on Billy the Bat Boy's Corner. Anthony obviously knows a lot about pitching and the game of baseball. He's been involved for a long time, played at each level throughout the minor leagues, up to the big leagues, and also in independent baseball. So it's obviously great to have him on and, and to share his thoughts on the game that it's become and how younger players can get themselves in front of coaches and during that recruitment process as well. We're supporting the Father English Center in Patterson, New Jersey. Don't forget that. And also, if you'd like to stay connected with us, be sure to check out at Billy the Bat Boy and at Up on Game Network on social media. Be sure to rate, subscribe, review, and we'll see you next time here on Billy the Bat Boy's Corner.